Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. In this video, I'm gonna be building myself a very fast 486. Now, I've been building systems for this YouTube channel for over a year now, and all of them have been built for the video and then put into storage, apart from the Dell 486. But it's still not got a permanent residence on my desk or gaming area. So in this video, I'm gonna put a change to that. I'm gonna build a 486, which is gonna be permanently at my desk set up so I can use it whenever I want. Now, as a base, for the build. I'm going to use the 486 that I used for the 486 build off last year. I'm very happy with the machine and it's a very good 486 but I'm not particularly fond of the case. It's It looks okay on the face of it but it is quite beaten up and it's got a megahertz display which is irrelevant for this this particular 486 because the turbo functionality doesn't work on it so there's no point having that. And I recently picked up I did a video on it. I picked up a machine that came with this case, which can take AT systems. So I decided I might as well move that system into this case because it's a much nicer looking case in my opinion. And it's gonna look good next to my Windows 11 modern system. Now the original goal when I built this 486 for the 486 build off was to try and imitate my original PC that I owned, which was a DX4. But as I found out while running the DX4, the rose tinted nostalgia glasses were in play and the games I used to play on that 486 were virtually unplayable on this system even though it is quite a fast 486. So before I finish that video I did put a 133 megahertz AMD processor in there, processor in there and in this video I'm going to upgrade it to well overclock it to 160 megahertz. That's of course is going to overclock the bus as well which make the VGA card faster as well as everything else. So that's enough talking. The plan then is to strip all the components out of this case and then I'm, I need to give this case a good clean up because it has arrived to me quite dirty and the power button is very sticky. Sometimes it takes quite a bit of effort to get it to stay in. And then I'll fit all the components into the bigger case, into the new case, overclock the CPU to 160 megahertz and install some games. Also, before I do crack on with removing all the components from the smaller case. I do want to say a big thank you to everyone who subscribed recently. My channel has almost doubled in size in a very short space of time. I appreciate everyone that's taken the time to watch the videos, hit like and hit subscribe. It does mean a lot to me that people are enjoying my content and I'm enjoying making these videos. So thank you very much. So with everything out of the case, time to have a look at the components that are gonna make up this build. Now first up, we have the motherboard, which is a PC Chips M918. Despite being made by PC Chips, it is quite a good board, well in my opinion, but the stats as well do, do reflect that. It's got an ALI chipset and supports almost all of the 486 class CPUs. As for connectivity, we've got four ISA slots, three PCI slots, built-in IDE and floppy, as well as serial and parallel ports, a single AT connector for the keyboard, four slots for memory, and it does support EDO. 
And also, you do have to roll the dice with these boards, but this is real cash chips on this one, which is good. Something I am quite happy about with this board is it wasn't working when I first picked it up and a little bit of troubleshooting, I realized it would work with five volt CPUs. And I ended up having to change this transistor with the help of some people on Vogons to track down the right part number. But after replacing that, it now works perfectly fine. You'll also see, if you do know this board, I've got it jumpered for 160 megahertz already because I did test it a while back just to make sure it would run like this. And it seems fine. We've got a coin cell battery as well. So there is no need to worry about any corrosion on this board. For memory, I've got two 16 megabyte sticks, so 32 megabytes in total, which is more than enough for a top of the line 486 system. My choice of sound card was not straightforward. I do have a number of ISA sound cards, including one with built-in wavetable, but I've had a little bit of trouble in the past with the compatibility with it. So just for complete easiness, I'm going to stick with this Sound Blaster Vibra 16. It does have genuine OPL3 on there, which as we know sounds great. My original 486DX4 back in the day did have a Sound Blaster 2.0 on it, but they cost too much for a start. And the Vibra 16 is a good enough card. The FM sounds just how I remember it, so that's the main thing. Now the video card is where my main disappointment lies. I did have an S3 Verge, but unfortunately that started misbehaving. So I did have to fit this Trio 64 V Plus instead. My original DX4 did have a Diamond Stealth 2000. And although you can get cards with the exact same chip on for pretty reasonable prices, for some reason the Diamond branded cards, they, they seem to retain a, a good value and people are asking a lot of money for them on eBay. So for the time being, I'm still looking out for one for a good price, but until then, this card will have to be enough. As for the hard drive, I'm going to stick with a mechanical one because I do enjoy listening to the old sounds. I did have this Seagate model fitted. I'm going to keep it fitted because it's still got everything installed as I, as I want it, but it is only 545 megabytes and I'm going to need more space than that. And the, the BIOS is, I think it's limited to two gigabytes. So I can fit something bigger in. I may fit just a second one alongside it or upgrade this one. I'm not sure yet. But for the rest of the build, I will be sticking with this one for now. Now the case isn't in too bad shape. So I'm just going to give it a quick once over with some elbow grease. And I will take the front panel off and have a look at why that power button is a little bit sticky. But apart from that, the case shouldn't need too much work. I'm going to leave the optical drive and a floppy drive in there. I have not tested those yet, but so hopefully they do work. But let's give the case a clean and then start getting some components inside. Now, as you look at that, this case is cleaned up beautifully. Not looking new, but for something that could, could well be 25 to 30 years old, that's looking good. Now, I did test this power supply when it was it had the previous system in it. But before I go ahead and put all of my nice 486 stuff inside it, might be worth just wiring up the sacrificial hard drive and fan and giving it a test. Yep, still seems good. Perhaps I will use another drive for now. I always like to judge speakers on how heavy they are and this weighs 
absolutely nothing. Moving on to reassembling the computer into the new case, I've discovered another feature of this case that I really like, and that is that the motherboard tray and the rear panel completely comes out of the case, which is going to make installing and wiring everything up to the motherboard a much easier task than it would have if I was to have to do that all inside the case. So this case does support AT and ATX motherboards, and it's got standoffs for the standard ATX mounting points, but it's also got those sliding holes where you can slide in the plastic grommets for an AT motherboard. Now I have gone ahead and arranged them as they need to be for this motherboard off of camera because they can be a little bit fiddly, but it's mounted quite well. It's got two screws at the back here and plastic standoffs around the rest of the motherboard. There's a little bit of movement in it still, but that's pretty normal for these boards. Once I get the expansion cards in, they should lock it in place. First off, I'm gonna plug in the serial and parallel ports. Now there is actually a PS2 header, or not a, a PS2 connector on this case, but unfortunately there's not a PS2 header on the motherboard, so I won't be able to use that. Now I can add the VGA card back into the system. Quite tight, but it's in. Now I'll go ahead and add the sound card into the system. Now both of those are actually quite stiff to get in. So I did have to turn the camera off while I used a little bit of persuasion, especially to get the sound card in, but they are in now. And hopefully they won't be moving anywhere. I can also fit the ribbon cables before I put the tray back into the case. Future Lewis here. So although this build is going okay, there's been a lot of unexpected annoyances, which means I've had to make a lot of cuts in the next section of the video. So the next section will look, could be a bit jumpy with bits missing, but I'll try and edit it as best as I can and I'll catch up once the build is finished. Now I fitted this tray back in off camera because it was a big pain to get back in because the bottom of the motherboard hangs just over the tray and it was catching on here. And these little hinges where it sits, they would not sit in properly without the motherboard being out. But I did get there eventually. And then it's just a case of doing up these two screws on the back, on the side even, and then that one and that one on the back. Now some of you may have noticed when I was putting the parallel cable in that I did manage to block the AT power connector so I've had to pull that out in order to plug that connector in. Black to black of course with the two connectors. I did that off camera because it did get a little bit fiddly and there were some non YouTube friendly words uttered while I was doing it. So because the other CD drive had a bit of a rattle and I didn't really have time to look into that now I'm going to fit this model. It's not a very fast one, and I've actually written slow on it because it was quite slow to read discs, but it should be good enough for what I need now, and it does look a good match for the case. So I'm going to go ahead with this one. Before I do that, I am going to refit this speaker system in it so I can have a play around, see what it sounds like. Now that was a really tight fit 
and the CD drive does seem to protrude out of the case slightly but that is in as far as it will go so I definitely will end up looking to change this CD drive at some point because I'm not really very happy with that. Now I just need to add in the hard drive and screw in the CD drive. So I've jumped forward a bit here again and that's because everything so far in this case has just proved to be really tight and I couldn't actually get the hard drive in to the bottom. I had to move it up and it was a bit of a pain getting it up there but it's in there now. So now it's just onto the cabling. So you have to excuse the mess of cables, it's just temporary, although it's not going to get much better than that to be honest. But it's time to see if this still works after all of this. Right, so let's try that again. As you may notice, the uh, optical drive and the speaker are removed because I've just had to take the whole front panel off of this case again because the power switch actually, it wasn't being pushed in far enough to keep the button held down permanently. So hopefully I've added some spaces and hopefully now it will work. Boom. So more updates, this CD drive isn't working at all and it seems like this floppy drive doesn't work. So I think I'm stripping this case down now for a fourth time. So what a mission this has been. This is now the third day of what has basically just been a glorified case swap. But I have had problem after problem. My first problem revolved around this power switch which was it wasn't going in enough to the case to fully latch the power switch so i did a modification to that which didn't it worked for a little while but then failed so i had to figure out something more permanent so i did find some rubber spacers which worked in the end and now that's working fine the next problem i had was the floppy drive although it was being recognized the motors just weren't spinning in it at all and it was just coming up with the devices not ready so i swapped it out for another one and that had the exact same problem. So then the next step was to change the floppy cable. And of course, that's what it was. A simple floppy cable swap and now both floppy drives worked. And then we have the third problem, the CD drive. That wasn't being recognized at all. So at first I thought perhaps I've got another dodgy cable. So I swapped that around and no joy. And after messing around a little bit, I realized that the secondary IDE channel, for whatever reason, is not working on this motherboard. So I've just set it as a slave on the master channel and now it's working fine. But that wasn't the end to my problems. Next up, once I had got into Windows with a working floppy drive and working CD drive, my sound card was no longer detected. It was in the bottom slot, which is where it was previously, and it just wasn't being detected at all. So I've moved it up a couple of slots and now it's been detected absolutely fine. So it's not ideal, but it's working now, which is the main thing. So the cables are looking a bit of a mess at the minute, but I just want to get Windows 95 reinstalled. And then if everything goes to plan, I'll give it a bit of a tidy up and cable tie some of these cables, make it a bit tidier in here. I have also changed the hard drive to a two gigabyte model because the 500 megabyte one was never really going to be enough. And this one's also quite a bit quieter. I've also mounted it in this convenient bay just under the power supply because they were a really tough fit trying to get them into this drive bay cage and it's easier for cable management as well if it's up there so I'm happy with that. So now I'm going to go away and install Windows 95. I don't need to time lapse that, we've done that enough times on this channel now. And I'll jump back when that's installed and all the drivers are set up.
So the Windows 95 install is finished. That went really smoothly. It didn't take too long actually. I've set up the sound card as I would like and I've already installed Transport Tycoon. I've made myself a boot disk. It's got some of the benchmark programs from Phil's DOS benchmark pack but it's also on a boot disk. So it hasn't got all of them on, just the ones that will fit onto a single disk but I'm going to run a few of them now and see just what sort of performance I can get out of this 160 MHz 486. eighty three point seven in three D bench two. So here you can see the speed test results. You can see we're running at 160 megahertz there and we are clear of the stock 133 megahertz 5x86. I think what's probably holding this system back now is the VGA card which hopefully I'll be able to find a a better S3 verge or something similar along those lines. For a good price in the future. So that's where I'm going to finish this video. It's taken quite a while now to swap these two cases. It's actually taken me nearly three days with all the problems I've had. There's been quite a lot of cuts in this video which I do apologize for but hopefully it does make some sense. Now all I need to do is start installing some of my favorite games, early Windows 95 and late DOS games and go and play them and enjoy them. So if you've enjoyed this video please give it a like and if you would like to see more content like this in the future then hit the subscribe button. Thanks.